and welcome to another episode of The Hump with Katie. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau, and I have such a fun interview for you today with the great bassist, educator, and writer of many amazing books, Danny Zeman. If you're new to The Hump, this is a series where I interview some of the world's most fantastic artists and musicians and find out why are they so amazing, how did it all happen, and ultimately, what can we learn from their journey? We've already had some fantastic guests. You can listen to all these episodes and more on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and you can go watch them on YouTube. So go subscribe, download, leave a comment, and let me know who you want to hear from next. Before I bring you today's amazing episode, I'd love to thank our sponsors. And first up, we have the clothing company, Jams World. You guys, I absolutely love Jams World. I'm wearing a Jams World right now, of course. And the reason why I love it is because the fabric is made from 100% Spun Crush Rayon, and it keeps me cool and comfortable. They've been making clothing in Honolulu, Hawaii since 1964. And the artwork is so unique. It's screen printed right onto the fabric, and it looks like a piece of art. Go to jamsworld.com and use the promo code jazz15 and you'll get 15% off your entire online purchase. Next up, I'd like to thank Colstein's String Shop. I absolutely love Colstein's. They are doing amazing things for the bass community. They have two amazing locations in Long Island, New York and a killer online store. Go to colstein.com and use the promo code KD10 and you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. All right, the time has come to bring you our guest today, and of course, it's Danny Zeman. Danny is amazing, and he's done so much for the bass community. I was so interested to talk to Danny because of his love of teaching and of all things bass. We talked about his time in Buffalo and Rochester, then moving his whole entire life all the way to Switzerland to go to school. He has four amazing bass pedagogy books, and one about teaching, how to teach teachers. He's done his research on how to research, and he loves to teach, and he's got a bunch of courses on Discover Double Bass and his own thing going on. Of course, I'll leave links to everything so you can find out more about Danny. It was so much fun speaking with him. I know you're going to love this interview. So without further ado, here's Danny Zeman. Um, well, I want to get to your your beginning, your origin story, as I call it. I think of everybody like as a superhero and everyone's got some sort of, I think like we'd all have our own comic book strip. And then I imagine that we'd have like, like, you know, like the spider verse and we'd all meet together. The yeah. what is it the multiverse? But anyways, but I am curious. I'll start off the bat. Like, how did you get so much into pedagogy or pedagogy, however people pronounce that. Yeah, so I <clears throat> uh, I was bit by a spider as a kid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I, it's funny, like, you know, when you look forward, you can never predict where things are going, but if you look backwards, you're like, oh, this makes kind of a straight line. Um, and I think it was just a lot of the right influences and in the right moments that, mm-hmm. that kind of, um, I don't know, just built it in my subconscious that I, subconscious that I wanted to that I wanted to teach. Um, <clears throat> I will say that, yeah, I was very fortunate to have some really excellent teachers that all miraculously came. F- they were cut from the same cloth. So, mm-hmm. like my first jazz bass teacher is a, a guy in Buffalo named Wayne Moose, and that's a perfect was, name for someone in upstate New York. <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a total upstate and a bass total player upstate. too. Totally. Yeah. It's yeah. a total, I mean, upstate is like its own little, uh, cultural micro oh, yeah. yeah. It's like its own province up there. <laughs> totally. Totally. Um, so when I was, when I was 10, right, like I got two things, I got a Samandel book and I got a book called jump right in, which was, um, I think I actually, I still have it on my shelf, but it's, it's basically a, an ear t- ear training curriculum kind of based around the research of a actually a bass player named Ed Gordon and I think he played with might have played with Glenn Miller or somebody like mm-hmm. in the, like legit played with him like in the 40s or 50s mm-hmm. and then he became a researcher and he wanted to figure out um, basically like how we can learn music in a way that resembles how we learn language he got really mm. deep into um, the, the concept of we learn by listening and then speaking and then reading and writing yeah right? which usually when you start off learning music it's like okay learn to read like this finger equals that note yeah you know and and we bypass bypass the ear so as i was learning hmm. as as a kid uh wayne told me when i was 10 he's like you're learning classical bass so you can learn to play in tune and then you're gonna be solfeging melodies and improvising bass lines with solfege and writing bass lines um because we want to work on your ears and make sure that you can actually hear how this stuff works. So I was like, I had a Walkman 
when I was a kid, I used to go upstairs in my bedroom and like sing like me, 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 Ray, Ray, Ray. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, those, those types of, uh, those types of tunes. So fast forward, I studied with him for four years. Like we're learning tunes, we're singing them. I go to high school. Uh, I went to two high schools. My first high school teacher was this brilliant, brilliant guy named Dave Stringham. He went to Eastman. He got a doctorate in music education. And he also, he studied with the guys who wrote that Jump Right In Mm. curriculum, who wrote that book with Ed Gordon, who did all of like this massive amount of ear training research. So he was having me, like he was a piano player. He was having me transcribe Dave Holland in ninth grade. Mm. He was having me write big band charts. We were learning, um, we were learning big band charts by ear actually like singing them first and then yeah having to play them so then i transferred to another high school that guy steve Schuen, uh taught there with with wayne moose steve got a doctorate from eastman also studied with the guys who did jump right in he influenced some of that um that as well so like continued to write big band charts and do lots of singing like he had us learn solos by ear mm. and, and we, we took all these improv classes Fast forward, I go to Eastman. I study with the guys who wrote wrote Jump Right In. So at that point, it's like my entire life has <laughs> been influenced by this this way of like pedagogical thinking. And you had um, already you you already jumped in. You were already there. I was. I jumped. You were just jumping. Jumped, yeah. <laughs> jumped right in, exactly. And it's it's one of those things where looking forward, it's like wow, I've been singing and doing solfege my entire life. And then looking back, it's like well, I started by experiencing it. Mm-hmm. And then I learned the the theory and the research behind it. And then as I got into college, like I loved teaching so much and I had so many good examples before me. And I realized how you know, your training is like, it's kind of like exercise, right? Like you can think about oh, yeah. exercise as something supplemental we do, or mm-hmm. you can just make it a lifestyle because it's necessary for us to live. And your training for me was was such such a part of that thing. And I had such good teachers and such creative teachers that were kind of standing against the status quo that I think it was just, um, I don't know. It was just like in me, like I needed to teach and share that with other people. And it's also like a great way to, you know, stand against some of the injustices that we experience with, with old, with old school teaching styles and, and, you know, the struggle, like the romanticized struggle of being an artist and all that stuff. So I don't know. There's a really long-winded answer, a long-winded way of saying like it all kind of, I don't know, it's, everything just kind of pushed me in that direction. No, that's great. And and I feel like the ear training and just singing what you play, like a lot of people are maybe just afraid to do it just because they've never tried it or they're like, they don't think their voice is good. But I mean, you know, it just makes everything so easy. Totally. And it, yeah, it's not about, it's not about sounding good, right? It's no. just about like, like when we sing, it's confirmation of what we're hearing. Yeah, so. exactly, exactly. Like I, I practice to a drone all the time, but if I have an issue, I'll, you know, sing it because I'm always right. And I, I'm not saying I'm not boasting, but like you're always right. Like the brain is always right, and I feel like people just don't trust themselves. Exactly. Well, and if you've if you've spent your entire life learning one way, right, and then this is a very vulnerable way of expressing yourself. It's like, of course, it's going to be scary, but everybody can sing you know like that's the one instrument that everybody carries with them yeah yeah oh that's great um yeah and it's so true what you were saying about um learning language because i always think like animals they're born and they just start talking to each other right and they can understand each other like if you separated a puppy and just put it in a box and then like a year later it it already know how to talk you know so i'm not putting any puppies in boxes for a year or anything but (laughs) Well, and even like, you know, cats, they meow because that's something that they learn from humans, right? So they know yeah. how to communicate with us. Like, oh, yeah. My cat got me good last night, two in the morning. <laughs> she didn't want anything, but she wanted just my attention. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Cats can cats can do that. Skywalker is just waiting to interrupt this interview. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you were in high school, too, at those programs, was it was it like one of those super programs or was it just like the local the local high school? It was, it was a public school and it was, it was definitely, um, you know, like I won't lie. It was a very well-funded public school, you know, from a nice community, um, where I was very lucky, like very fortunate, um, 
to have access to to a place like that because I understand it's not it's not the norm, um, but it just it it happened to be that there were just some incredible musicians, and I mean they were they were doing things like. Um, I remember one summer I played in the wind ensemble. Of course, I was like the jock of the music department. You know? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> do, do everything I could. Yeah. And our our teacher had us, he gave us a recording. And uh, it was a recording of Shostakovich's Gallop. And he recorded all of the individual parts. And he said, take this home for the summer. I want you to learn it by ear. And on day one, the wind ensemble got together and played Shostakovich Gallop. Like, no music. Yeah. And, and then we played uh, the finale from Shostakovich Symphony 5 by ear. Um, he did, like, memorized concerts, just singing parts mm. to students. And, and everybody ha- was required to write compositions in order to pass, you know, mu- music classes. So for us, it was like, it was a little bit, um, I don't know, it's like the opposite of using using, like, an essential elements book or something yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. a dig against the book it's just like that's one path and we we had this other one and it was always like oh those are like the hip, you know kind of the hippies you know, yeah, like the yeah hippie music school but yeah you know i i graduated with, graduated with people who went to juilliard and manhattan and like ended up having these really illustrious music careers all from this this public school yeah it- I, I didn't have this I went to a good high school but not not like that but I always found it fascinating that the teacher really like brings everyone together right and I always was like not everyone was a great musician in those instances but like you're saying they were able to memorize like a Shostakovich thing and they're just some normal kid right yeah yeah and and the the really cool thing about you know having um good influences in this time period you know th- there's uh research coming out where where researchers have shown that as a teacher the the experience that really informs the way you teach the most is is how you learned in high school Mm -hmm. so um even though i went to school like i studied teaching in a bachelor's and master's program like i still call my teacher steve shuin all the time and ask him for teaching advice and a lot of the things i do um i did with him or dave stringham or, or wayne first right so mm-hmm. it's it's just amazing the influence that that can have um you know subconsciously and then when you really dig back like wow like this this really informed so much of what of what i do because it was good yeah i know i was i was forbidden to use real books when i first started learning i didn't know what it was so it didn't matter but uh like most kids are forbidden to i don't know watch tv or something but i couldn't use real books so that's that's how i i do about it now yeah, and you were you were tw- 12 when you started playing jazz, right? Yeah. So it was nice to not even know the other side of it. But then when I was like, what is everyone carrying around this book for? Yeah. Just listen. And then you were, when you're like 18, you're like, when I was 12, they said I couldn't use real books. Like, ah, you know. Yeah. So like, <laughs> yeah. And, then, and then when you're on a gig, you're like, oh, wait, that that was awesome. Like, yeah. I'm happy I didn't even know that was a thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so what, we'll just go back a little bit further. So you got your first Samantha book at 10, but were you playing bass before that or any other instruments? So I, I had a um, dueling career as a heavy metal guitarist. Um, I wanted to be a guitarist like my entire life. So I was super into um, Metallica Right, it's the mm-hmm. first concert I ever went to. I have long hair, like shoulder length hair. I used to practice guitar like five, six hours a day because I thought it was just like the coolest shit ever. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I was I was studying. I mean, as seriously as you could as a you know a ten year old, mm-hmm. and studying bass, and then on the side like transcribing Metallica and Nirvana, um, Megadeth. You know. Like, <laughs> Well, yeah, like, you were into it. Totally. My mom and dad used to drive me to shows um, like in, in a place called Showplace Theater in Buffalo on Grant Street. This is like it's 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 not a neighborhood you want to like go mm-hmm. hang out at at night. And my parents used to accompany me when I was 12, like to those shows so I could go play with my heavy metal band. So like they, they were supportive. 
yeah, I mean, you know, bless them. <laughs> and they told me, like, yeah, I heard some stories about some of my trips down there when I was old enough to understand, you know, yeah. where where we were. Um, but that was, you know, that was kind of a uh, my, my side interest. And then when I was I think about 15, my teacher was like, listen, you know, heavy metal's cool, but like, let's dive more into jazz. You'll get more gigs. You're always going to work as a bass player. And at that point, I was like, okay. So I got into it, and then I met um, some really great guitar players in high school, like jazz guitarists, and I was <laughs> yeah. like, I'm done. You're like, you got, you got this. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So it, it sort of, you know, petered off. I was happy I had the experience with it, but um, yeah, it ultimately became about the bass then. One, one ner nerdy question. Did the guitar technique ever interfere with your upright bass technique? Like, the, you know, the left hand especially? Um, no, I just, I wanted to be able to sweep pick like blazing oh, okay. arpeggios on the guitar or on the, on the bass. And I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> no, but it, it actually, it helped later on because I never really, I never really like practiced bass guitar, but I could always sort of just play it because I had upright experience yeah. and then, you know, experience playing guitar. So I think it, it helped in some ways, but, um, yeah, it was just like. I don't know, I so desperately wanted to like be in a touring rock band. It was like, ah, the bass is just something my parents make me do, but guitar yeah. is like my pathway. And then, you know, <laughs> it totally wasn't. <laughs> um, so, well, we're glad for that. Um, but you, you obviously were practicing bass heavily and I read that you started like gigging around town. Wait, did you grow up in Buffalo? I did. Yeah, so like when you were like 15, 16? Yeah. My, uh, my buddy Do Dominic Masana, he he's awesome. Like he is the now he's a musical director for Action Bronson's TV show. Um, he used to like go out and hustle gigs for us. Like we played, like we had a steady gigs at an, uh, a restaurant called La Scala. Um, my other buddy Christian Robinson got us a steady gig at a an Italian restaurant called Rizzo's. So like <laughs> we're playing two three gigs a week in high school like yeah it was pretty pretty wild but we we used to um yeah like we had we had real books but we used to just play t like tunes we would always create a set list and like really shed the tunes and mm. we i also actually worked in a recording studio at that time um, oh that's very cool yeah so I, I got to make records with my my group for free like so we used to just play these gigs and go and make records and uh it's a little bit of a, a Disney-like experience looking back. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, even since like I was 15, like I never really had to hustle for gigs because other people <laughs> were always going for it. But um, yeah, it's like it just, it was such a wonderful part of, of, you know, really taking these things that I was studying and learning about in, in school and like just applying it to a situation where I was able to play without any sort of, supervision exactly right? kind of yeah freely. yeah oh that's really cool were you ever playing gigs where you were like sitting in with the local like the local cats the local heroes yeah and what was that like oh it was it was awesome there i can think of a few examples like uh there's a, a berry player named bruce johnstone yeah yeah and yeah so he bruce was in, in, in woody herman's band yeah yeah so bruce he sang the Buffalo. song i'm sorry but he sang um he sang one of the blueses, right? Yeah, he's. <laughs> he's uh, had some, yeah. I can't um, remember the name of it now, but like he sang uh, a chorus and Woody would sing a chorus. It's a slow blues. It'll yeah. come to me later. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So I used to I used to be able to sit in with with Bruce, um, and then got to got to know him and play with him later, and then Bobby Militello, um, the alto player for Dave Brubeck for mm -hmm. thir yeah thirty years. Um, and then later on, like George Caldwell, who played piano in the Basie band um, in the, I think in the 90s. I mean, there's like lots of, and Don Menza was, you know, from, yeah. from Buffalo. So like there are a lot of really heavy people around there where um, <clears throat> they were supportive of people who were like really putting in the energy and time to, to play jazz. So, yeah. and then also when I was 18, I mean, getting to play with, with guys like um, Bob Snyder, an incredible guitar player who teaches mm -hmm. in, in Rochester. Um, so it was just this opportunity to, like, obviously, like, I knew I wasn't a peer or a colleague at that point, but they tr they treated me like one. So I was able to really kind of step up and, and, and play and learn. It's just like, you know, 
you you get the uh, musical intensity of like a really amazing yeah. gig, but without the pressure of <laughs> getting fired. Oh, that's nice. Uh, did, was it one of those things like a couple of years later that you were like, you were like, oh man, I couldn't believe I got to play with this person. Like at the time, did you know a lot about them? Not so much. I, just, I mean, through through Wayne, because Wayne used to invite me to his gigs and I would go hear him play and he would he would encourage me to sit in, which was really awesome. Um, so, yeah, like I didn't understand <laughs> really like, you know, that it was Bruce Johnston yeah. or, uh, you know, Bobby Militello or or those guys. But um, you, you could tell just by the the vibe of the audience that they were you know very well well respected and then yeah looking back I was like holy crap like yeah was very very lucky yeah it was probably probably better off that way that you just were focusing on the music yeah I mean of course I was still terrified like a little <laughs> bit when I was up there I was like don't mess up don't mess up don't yeah. mess up and then of course like you know at 16 I was like don't slow down don't slow down don't slow down <laughs> yeah um was it a like a direct path to go to Eastman? Like was that it was just kind of like written that way or or did you have other aspirations? Um I didn't really know about many other schools. I think it was kind of written that well and everyone that, who you knew from there was just like the best. Yeah, they were they were killing it. I mean in, in Eastman at that time when I was applying um you know like Kneebody had just graduated from their and um, there were some really amazing, like younger piano players like Chris Yemba and Jeremy Siskind. Um, yeah, just like lots of people I knew, like sort of took the pipeline from Buffalo to Rochester mm -hmm. to, to go there. And so, funny story. You know, I knew I want. I knew I wanted to apply there. I got rejected from a bunch of colleges. And me um, too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I applied initially for I was only going to apply for music education mm -hmm. right and, and a week before the jazz deadline I was like I don't know if I want to spend the money on a recording session you know things that 18 year olds think about it's like should I pay for gas or a recording session yeah and um you know I didn't want to record it myself I was like I need to go to a legit studio so my sister was like just go do it like just just go for it so like a week before <laughs> the jazz deadline I made a tape, submitted it, did not get accepted for music education, and was the only bass player that got taken in for, for jazz studies that year. So it was nice. like serendipitous that I went down that road. Um, I later learned that it was because my grades were less than adequate in high school, which, Aww. yeah, it's okay. I mean, I wasn't trying to be, you know, valedictorian of my class. <laughs> um, chemistry took a back seat to music. Yeah which is which is fine um and then i added music education my my second year but it was sort of like this weird like almost missed the opportunity and just threaded the needle at, yeah. at the last moment um and then i didn't suck in classes anymore my grades were were, were great because i was interested in what i was doing but yeah it's like kind of always just i don't know it's like it was just eastman even when i was a kid it's like that was the place to be so that's where i wanted to go yeah and while you're there yeah, I know that's like a, such a serious school with great, great educators. Um, did the location, well, you kind of already grew up in that general part of New York, but did it, did it make a difference on your, you know, college experience being kind of far away from a lot of things? It was, it was tough. I was, uh, you know, as many high schoolers going to college, like juggling a long distance relationship at the time, which um, ultimately didn't pan out, which is a great thing. And uh, so I was like, I miss home and I miss my friends. And the transition to college was actually quite difficult for me. Um, and even though it was like close, you know, if you can't drive or you don't have a car, then it's like, you know, might as well be like in the middle of Missouri or somewhere that's mm -hmm. like a thousand miles away from home. But it did really, it's like one of those moments that forces you to grow up. So like, I had to get comfortable in my skin, figure out my surroundings, like figure out how to tap into what what Eastman offered. Hi, Hi Skywalker. Um, yeah, Skywalker. <laughs> the streets. Um, and then of course, you know, everyone talks about Rochester is like, well, you know, if uh, if you just stay in your practice room, like it's cool because it snows and it's cold all the time anyway. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm already used to that. You know, I grew up in Buffalo. I'm like, yeah, you're not gonna you know, trick me on that one. Yeah, exactly, thick, thick skin. Um, 
but yeah, so it was uh, it was a bit of a uh, transition, but it definitely felt like a different city for me. I definitely made it home because I lived there for almost almost ten years, actually. Mm-hmm. I don't. I'm not going to ask how old you are. I mean, I could, but and you could answer. I can but, tell you. <laughs> well, because when you, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> third thirty and a half. I've, I turned thirty one in June. Oh wow! So yeah. Then we're on a different level. I'm 33 and it was like when I went to school, I'm not so great with technology, but like there was no YouTube. Like that was like just coming out. So did that, because that's crazy now, like how it affects and informs people. Was that huge for you when when you found YouTube? Maybe you found it much earlier than I did. I was like, I I can watch Ray Brown. That's just Chad Baker video. This is amazing. Yeah, (laughs) totally. Well, I found I found YouTube in like the later part of high school. So that's that's oh when gosh. Josh Redman's um, Elastic album came out mm-hmm. and people just freaked out. So like what I was watching on repeat or listening to on repeat was Joshua Redman and then Marco Panacea's early videos, because I was like, I don't know how people can play the bass like that. And I've told Marco that, too, like I was just so inspired by by what was what was out there and yeah i mean it was like it was at the time before uh the youtube rabbit hole was super deep yeah so i was like my friends and i would just get together and listen to that music and just like freak out over it and same same thing in college yeah it was like the one thing i would just like watch like two things on repeat that was it. totally you're like 500 of those views are mine like a little yeah. bit of monetization is because of me. <laughs> yeah it, go- it goes to me uh <laughs> Have you found that? I'm just curious. Have you found that as a good like resource for you, like when it first came out? When it first came out, yeah, I think it was, it was a bit novel. So um, definitely, like it's it's ama- It's funny because YouTube is like an amazing source of inspiration. It's also like the primary tool for procrastination. Yeah. And <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a balance. Now it's definitely formed a, a huge part of, of how I teach because if I need to pull up a recording, I can do it. Mm-hmm. If I need to recommend things for students, I can do that. And um, you know, even like in my master's thesis, I, like I did a, a survey of, of quite a few, like quite a large number of, of jazz education resources specifically for bass. And I go in, in depth about what's available on YouTube because mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's something that is a part of our society now, especially like as we move away from kind of cable and everything's really like it, everything's like all a cart too. It's like you can just watch what you want. Totally, totally. So it's it really is a uh, primary source for pedagogy. Of course, you have to you have to sift through everything. Yeah. But um, I mean, I think it's one of the one of the reasons why technique and and just what's possible on the basis accelerated so much in the last few years especially with like what younger people are able to do yeah um, it's because of the influence of that Mm -hmm. yeah i think it's a great tool while you were at eastman and so you had a double major right yeah and were you still were you able to gig around town and like do other work at the same time yeah so for the first two years it was a bit a bit tough because I was taking classical lessons and playing in the orchestra and playing in the jazz ensembles. I think I I did like a couple 25 or 27 credit semesters. So it's like rehearse an orchestra, then go to uh, jazz combo, then have dinner, then play in jazz ensemble and then take conducting class in theory. Like I have like six classes a day sometimes. Mm. Um, And it's funny, like, as I was studying, I felt my my classical chops like sort of hit a plateau, but jazz kept on going. So then I kept on taking more and more gigs. And I got to a point like senior year, where I was actually gigging almost like four to five times a week because I would just say yes to everything. Mm-hmm. It was at a time where all the seniors had just left. So I was like, you know, I was around and, and eager to play. So <laughs> I remember in college, I was like, like I saved up a bunch of money. I was like, I'm going to buy myself a vintage jazz bass. So I was like, you know, getting stuff like that instead of investing in retirement was like, you know, wh- whatever. Whatever. Like, yeah. Yeah. Got to spoil myself. But yeah, I was like, I was able to play a lot and there was a really supportive gigging scene. Um, so yeah, it was like, it was, it was cool to be able to do that because then of course you learn about these things in school, but it's just as important to have the freedom to do it without supervision and just oh yeah 
figure out what you want to sound like. Yeah, that's that's. I like that you've said that now twice. It's like playing without supervision because then then you have those moments like you might do something and afterwards you go, that's what my teacher was talking about. That's why I should do or or don't do that. Totally. Yeah, and just, and uh, yeah, like that, and just having the ability to play without not even the worries of a grade, but I mean. I get. Uh, uh, I guess the way that I would frame this is, oftentimes what happens after we graduate from music school is we have these ghosts that kick around that are like, <laughs> "Oh, you shouldn't do that," or like, "Oh, don't play that lick," or "Are you slowing down?" It's like these, these things that are just chirping in the back of our head that are not not too friendly, and it's really hard to get out of the student mindset. Mm-hmm. And so the more we can do that as we're learning, it's like school plays a huge part. It can play a huge part in our development. Uh, but just as much like we need the time to be able to just do things on our own and sort of contextualize our experience in the grand scheme of things. Uh, but it's it it I, like, I know some people who have sort of been plagued by that mindset, and, like ended up leaving music because they yeah. were never able to really shed that experience. Yeah, it's true. I, I got I don't maybe we talked about this on your um, base retreat that I got great advice from John Clayton one time because it was when I first like moved back to LA and was doing uh you know you know like playing whatever in a bar or restaurant or whatever and I was I was like kind of complaining I was like I don't like playing when people aren't listening and of, of course he put me in my place but he said um he's like from now on there's no more practicing it's always performing even when you are practicing at home and he said you just imagine that I'm there in the audience that like you know your heroes are there in the audience and it totally shifted my mindset and then of course they do they do pop up like they'll come to your gigs like like john clayton will just show up because that's like him or like jeff hamilton will will come out and then and then you're not you're not nervous anymore you're like oh they've been here the whole time yeah yeah and you're excited to play for them because they they respect you right and you're you're excited to be able to show your contribution to the music yeah like it's kind of a um yeah, it's kind of like a blessing to be able to do that, I guess, like to, to be able to participate. And and it's not about you or your ego, right? Like you're serving the music. Yeah, and, and that's, exactly. Like, that's a huge, a huge gift. Yeah, I know. I turned the interview, the psychiatrist chair around for a second, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's OK. It's OK. Psych, psych me out. <laughs> yeah. Sky, Skywalker's like, this is daddy's interview. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he wants to leave. I'm actually going to let him out because he's going to continue to. Uh, sure, that's to it. It's fine. You want to leave? You want to leave? Okay. <laughs> he's going to meow again in like 30 seconds. Like, let me back in, you jerk. Yeah. Um, so tell me about uh, the the focus year, the jazz campus focus year. What is that? That was that was a wild experience. Um, so that was an artist diploma program. I actually went, was part of the inaugural class of that. They're now, I saw that, yeah. I think they're now on the fifth, you see the the fourth band and they're already up auditioning for the fifth year. It's like mm-hmm. crazy. Um, the short of it is that it was it was try, it was like the Monk Institute, but in Europe because um, Europe doesn't really have, and I say like continental Europe doesn't really have an artist diploma program, mm-hmm. um, jazz specific. So. This was the brainchild of Wolfgang Muchpiel, great guitar player. And um, we essentially, like we got a stipend. It was a band of, I have to do math in my head, <laughs> full rhythm section plus three horns and a singer. I think that equals nine people. Okay. Um, and yeah, it was a group of nine people. It was kind of like a reality TV show. We all- uh, It's all international were, too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We had uh, people from Spain, France, Argentina, uh, Switzerland, Poland. I was the only person from the U.S., Hungary, Russia. It's like, you know, you're like the U.N. of jazz musicians. Oh, yeah. And um, <clears throat> so we played together daily, like six hours a day. Oh, wait, but for... back up for a second. Like, how okay. did you how did it happen for you? So this was, uh, so I first heard about it through Larry Grenadier. Um, mm-hmm. And at that point I had taken lessons from Larry for a few years. And he was like, hey, I remember the conversation. I was at, a, at one of his gigs in, in uh, downstate New York, just like hearing him and his, and his wife, Rebecca. 
He's like, hey man, there's like this program called Focus Year. Like you should check it out. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it's in Switzerland and it's not a bad way to spend a year. I was like, all right. Yeah. So, was, you know, this was a year before we, there were even auditions for it. So I kind of kept on, on bugging him. And then he's like, yeah, the auditions are open. Like you should, you should apply. So um, I, I sent in the application. So I wrote a cover letter, had to um, submit recordings, CV, all this stuff. I got an audition. I had to fly to Switzerland for three days um, in the middle of, it's like in the middle of start, like I started my master's program at that point. It's like six months in. Oh, at Eastman? Yeah, at at Eastman. Okay. This was 2006, 2015, I know 2016 I applied for it, September. Um, Flew to Switzerland in February of 2017 for the audition. All right, so I was there for three days. There were four bass players, five drummers. Um, I walk into my audition to play, and Jorge Rossi is the drummer for the audition. So I'm like, "Very that's cool. pretty fucking cool. Yeah, it's <laughs> pretty awesome. And then um, so I played for a panel of people that included like Wolfgang and some great Swiss musicians like Dominic Landolf and, and yeah, so a whole bunch of people. So they wanted to like see how we played um, oh, and Guillermo Klein was there too. We were playing a bunch of his music. They wanted to see how we played, but they also wanted to see how we interacted with one another, just mm-hmm. to make sure that we were a good f- vibe or good fit, um, personality-wise. And so at that point too, at Eastman, I was like really loving the the class, like for the music education classes. I loved it. I was gigging all the times with my friends. Um, and then I got a call from an Austrian number in the middle of April, and it's Wolfgang. He's like, "Hey, Danny, congratulations! Like you got the gig." And I was like. All right, I'm moving to Switzerland. So wow. Like, I put the pause on uh, I put the pause on the master's degree, just like, you know, held my my spot for a year, sold a bunch of my crap, like got rid of my apartment and just moved moved to Switzerland. And it was all just because Larry was like, "Hey, you should check this out. It'd be, <laughs> it would be awesome." Um, and for me, I'm always like pull the trigger pull the trigger first and like yeah. ask questions later. So it wasn't like considering the fact that I didn't speak any German mm-hmm. or like didn't even really know anything about Switzerland except for chocolate and they were like extremely rich. Yeah. Um, like I knew nothing. I knew nothing. So I was like, okay, yeah, I'll move myself across the world. Like, you know, live with people I've never met before in a place with, with language that I don't speak and rules that I don't understand. Like, But like, you seemed sure. much more gung ho than when you went from Buffalo to Rochester. For sure. Yeah. So I was like terrified. It's like it's 60 miles away. (laughs) And at this point, too, I had done a lot of a lot of touring through Europe. Okay. Um, so so I was like accustomed to to traveling and and flying and stuff. So I was like, okay, so like I'm I'm I'd never been to Switzerland before, but like I'd been to Europe enough where I was like I'm I'm familiar with with, uh, you know, I'm more comfortable with the concept of going further away from home. and then the program itself was was amazing. It was also ex- like it was extremely difficult um, emotionally because it's just you're spending most of your time with a few people. Yeah. Right. And it's really, really intense. <laughs> Could be like a panic uh, room situation. <laughs> yeah, we had some we had some situations that required interventions like internal interventions. Yeah. But the program was really awesome because they also uh, they supplied us with kind of uh, like a body coach and a, a like a counselor. You know, to really just make sure that we were all in like a good, a good place. Oh wow, this um, is like when astronauts prepare to go to space. It was kind of like going to space, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Um, but we we got to play. I mean, literally every day for six hours, we mm-hmm. were rehearsing for nine months, like, Monday through Friday, and we would have a week of our own rehearsal time, and then a week with a guest artist. So this included um, Kurt Rosenwinkel. Uh, so Guillermo Klein was the first concert. Then we played the music of Kurt Rosenwinkel. Then we had Avishai Cohen, the trumpet player, Django Bates. Um, Larry Grenadier came in. We had Joshua Redman, Mark Turner, Dave Holland. Like I got to play in a group with Dave Holland for a week where we were just trading choruses. And Wow. Uh, what was that like? That was wild. I mean, Dave, Dave Holland is like, and I, it's like hanging out with, uh like i don't know he has this this vibe where he's like like the ultimate gentleman like he's got this huge presence but it's like 
hanging out with someone in your family who's just willing to share stories and just like, you know, like he creates this environment and this aura that is just so professional. Mm -hmm. And so like, you just want to be a part of it because everything he does just gives you so much energy and gives you so much information. Um, and playing with him was, was super cool. I got a lesson with him that I recorded of course. And, um, yeah, it's just like, getting to hang with all of these people. I got to play with my heroes. You know, I go from listening to Joshua Redman on YouTube when I'm when I'm 16 to like playing a concert of his music and, and talking like for hours about mm -hmm. espresso machines and espresso roasting. So it's yeah. like it's really geeky kind of full circle experience for me. That's great. And then did you go back to, to Rochester to finish? I did. So at first, like when I got to Switzerland, I was like, I miss home. And then the, then by the time I was done, um, I was like, I don't really like I don't really want to leave. Like I kind of you know, I really like being, uh, you know, being in Switzerland and like the the just the, the school. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the jazz campus was incredible. Like Jorge Rossi it, teaches there few times a month jeff ballard is one of the drum teachers larry larry grenadier is one of the bass teachers along with this guy ben's uh erster it's a really great swiss bass player mark turner is there wolfgang muchbiel lino lueke teaches guitar there i mean one of the days that i was there with focus year it's like josh redman mark turner and dave liebman were all teaching on the same day wow wild I mean, it's like yeah Disney. so why why leave totally but I ultimately, I did go back to finish the masters um, because I knew that it would be beneficial. Like I was, I was um, fortunate to be in, in the program and you know, I was really cutting my teeth on my writing chops. Like that's why I went back for the masters is to mm -hmm. learn how to do research, design better curricular materials and to really get my writing chops up. So as like, as, as soon as I was done with that, it's like, I never have to go back to school again if I don't want to. Yeah. And I already had a lot of time money and everything invested into it so it's like <clears throat> but i was like super high off of life coming back from that oh that i know experience. yeah yeah those feelings yeah yeah i had i don't i didn't have a similar experience but when i moved to ecuador it was the same thing i was like went with one suitcase it's like you know was there for a year and it was just yeah it was incredible yeah you get on this little high <clears throat> totally and and the the relationships i've i've made from that program i mean I still tour with a with a lot of the people from the group. Um, you know, I, I had a good, uh, I developed a good friendship with some of the teachers there, like Wolfgang, who lives in Vienna. I was supposed to go on tour with him actually in <clears throat> November. It was going to be with with Wolfgang and with Jeff Ballard, and <laughs> the tour got canceled two days before it started because of a shutdown. It was like an mm -hmm. you know, ECM tour, which like broke my heart. But, yeah, it'll come but back. Yeah, I mean, I know th I know those things, you know, they, they'd come back. But um, made a record with Jorge Rossi, and we went on tour last year, and then we played a couple gigs in, in the Bird's Eye in, in Switzerland in October. It's like those types of connections, it's it's awesome because there are, you know, you can move to New York, you can move to different places, but <clears throat> if, you, if you play with great musicians, like, I mean, honestly, they don't need – they need 30 seconds to hear if they yeah. like you or not. Yeah. <clears throat> then it's just a matter of getting a, the opportunity to, to develop a relationship with them. Like, mm -hmm. do they like you as people? Do you get along? Do you, do you have a good vibe? And it's like, there are so many ways you can do that, right? It's, you don't have to move to a particular place. And, and Focus exactly. Here for me was, was, was a real, um, yeah, just prove that to me. You know, I didn't have New York anxiety as much because I was like, yes. oh, I'm, meeting, I'm meeting the people I want to play with already. Yeah, that's so true. And just like you said there, at the beginning, there's different paths. Like you had the path of like ear training and solfege and you didn't feel compelled to go go to New York City and, and do that grind. Uh, yeah, that's great. Because I, I always, I mean, there's great players everywhere in every corner totally. of, of the world. So they don't have to have some, you know, flashy name either. Uh, I played with a Brazilian guitarist last time I was there in like a, in a pizza place and he was like one of the best musicians I've ever played with and it was like I'll go back and pl to play with him yeah yeah absolutely I mean there are great players everywhere because it is a universal it is a universal music now and that that's something that Steve Swallow said actually when we when we played with him he had some great stories but but he was uh 
he was telling us that it's not necessary to to move anywhere. He's like, there are great musicians everywhere, and with with YouTube, um, you can like you can hear about great musicians from everywhere too. It's like the world is it's such a it's such a small place, right? So the 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 jazz scene, well, there there are certain places that there is a higher population of jazz musicians, and it is inspiring and great to go and and um, really go through the grind like. Mm -hmm. you know the 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 music community is really a global community so yeah it's it's uh yeah you can you can do it from everywhere (laughs) um i don't want to take up too much more of your time danny we should get some rest um but i do want to ask about you have is it like five books now actually published i'm sure you have like 20 in the works but (laughs) um so i have four four base books and then one uh, book that I co-authored on uh, just co- it's called reflective music teaching so like uh, ideas for um, just yeah being a more reflective music teacher and really getting the most out of student outcomes yeah it's tough I mean and, and music teachers especially need that support because it's not like yeah, every teacher has um, you know a difficult job but when you teach math you don't really take that home with you right you don't have yeah. like a math concert to prepare for you don't I mean, you got to make sure your kids, the kids' grades are, are good, but there's so much extra pressure for music teachers. Absolutely. Well, and, and the the rate of teachers, like the rate of music teachers who drop out within the first five years is astounding. You know, mm-hmm. And a lot of it, um, I think it comes from pressure of like, am I doing this right? Uh, who are the people, like who are the stakeholders of my success? Like what mm-hmm. types of things should I be concerned about or not worried about? Um, yeah, there's a lot of pressure on new teachers everywhere for every subject. So um, this was, yeah, this was something that we, we thought could be a, a valuable contribution to teachers, especially in the beginning parts of their their careers. Yeah, oh, that's great, that's awesome. And then you have three courses on Discover Double Bass, right? Yes, um, Walk On, The Bass Player's Guide to the Trio, and uh, the, rhythm, the Bass Player's Rhythm Workshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah I love great, it. Like it's, they're great resources. You're Thank you're you. you're really good at explaining the information in a quick way where it makes sense. Thank you. Well, it's it's fun, especially because I don't get to I don't really I mean at least in the context of teaching this stuff, I don't get to interact with the people directly on the other side, mm-hmm. right? So it's like, how can you explain something in a way that accounts? Like, first off, you account for the assumptions of the people who are taking the course. Like, do they have experience with theory? Can mm-hmm. they, do they know all of their major scales? If you say C major seven, will they know what that means? Or if you yeah. say tritone sub, um, or if you say play ahead of the beat, like, do they have a reference for that? Yeah. So it really forces me to be very specific about what I'm saying, um, to really specify who the information is for. And then it's still try and create motivation, like m- motivation being a one way road, right? Like, which, I mean, other people do it well. Like if you watch an exercise video, <clears throat> it's yeah. like a hundred percent motivation, right? So it's like, how can we tap into some of these things and still make really um, clear outcomes for the students if you don't get to work with them? So videos are one way, like the mm. books are another way. Um, but writing those and creating those resources absolutely made me a better teacher and absolutely improved my musicianship mm. tenfold. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. That's great. Um, I, I just lost my thought. No, um, it's coming to me. Sorry. All good. Um, what was I gonna say? I won't even edit this part out. This will stay. Um, <laughs> shoot. Okay, it'll it'll come back back to me but you know that makes sense too it's like how do you convey something without being there in person and making sure that they get the outcome they're wanting exactly because it it can be so easy like i am i am uh i'm saying this not in criticism of other people but as a reflection of what what i have done in the past and if i if i've ever said you know just practice this 10 times and then move on it's like Mm -hmm. well couple questions pop into my mind right what happens if it takes a student 11 times to get it right Mm -hmm. or um what if they practice it yeah what if they practice it for 10 times and it's still 
and if it's still wrong mm -hmm. or what does that mean like is 10 times a form of assessment mm -hmm. like after 10 times they should be able to do it right like well then how else can i explain that like how else can i hold them accountable to to their progress and to their outcomes so it really forces me to get past it's like those bumper sticker sayings right like <laughs> um you know like uh Oh, like this too, sh like, you know, this too shall pass or like, yeah. you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's like, yeah, okay. But like, it doesn't actually, like, it sounds good, but it doesn't really help. Yeah. Yeah. And, and teaching can be, I mean, it can be full of those landmines where you can say something thinking that it, it will help the student, but like, it just causes more confusion or they understand what you're saying, but they still can't do it. Yeah. Um, and so that, that for me is like, that's where. Like pedagogy is, there's an art to it. There's this human element to it where like it, it's it's almost like therapy, right? Like it really depends on the the relationship between you and the person who's, who's yeah. giving it. Um, and there is there's tons of research behind it. Like humans are natural born teachers and they're natural born learners. And this is this stuff has been studied for hundreds of years. Like how to successfully teach other people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's fun to dig into all of those things and see what you do naturally, like where that falls into the history of teaching and how you can use some of those tools to inform what you do moving forward, how you can find your style as a teacher, like similar to, to being a player. Yeah. Um, but it's fun. It's always evolving. Yeah. I love it because everyone learns differently. And that's the, that's like the fun part for me is like getting in there and, and like a little detective and like, okay, that's not working for you. So let's try this. And that's that's the fun part. Yeah. And, and having the ability to, um, you know, before when I said, like, being a teacher has increased my musicianship tenfold. I, I mean that in the context of being reflective about what I've learned has really made me solidify, like, m not solidify my style, but just understand, like, what it is exactly that I'm that I'm doing, where it comes from. And then I get to like, I get the honor of passing along things that I learned. So like, um, you know, learning from Jeff Campbell, you know, the, the jazz bass teacher at Eastman, like some of his really pragmatic exercises for just learning mm -hmm. how to play the bass, like how the yeah. bass functions or, um, you know, some like really learn some kind of ground, like for me, groundbreaking things from from my lessons with Larry about playing with clarity and, and really creating clear bass lines and kind of getting to the core of your sound and, and mm. your ideas. Um, and then playing with like Bill Dobbins, they make a, a, you know, another person who I was yeah. very fortunate to, to be able to play with a, a lot and, and continue to, um, about the importance of accountability. Like if I play, he's going to stop me and say, Hey, I was playing this chord. You clearly weren't listening to me because yeah. you did this thing. Um, you know, and, and of course, like in a more graceful, graceful way, but um, it's like all those things become a part of my story and I get to draw from those experiences and figure out the best way to share that to another mm -hmm. student, kind of cut through the clutter um, and, and give them some of the tools to avoid some of those those landmines, but also like, yeah, pay respect to, to the people who taught me and, and be able to share, yeah, just sh share the joy and love of, of teaching and learning. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it's about sharing. I, I never understand some people like they don't want to give up their tricks, their secrets. And yeah, there's nothing to hide. Yeah. There's no, there, there is no secret. It's called one, three, five, flat seven, or yeah. one, three, five, seven, and then play with a great sound, right. Or play with like a, a consistent sound and be aware of your sense of time and play with them. it's like, that's, that's the recipe, right. Mm -hmm. But there's no substitute for just putting in the time and the experience and, and being in a supportive environment. So it's like, yeah. And really, you know, we learn through listening. Jazz is an oral yeah. art form. So, you know, I mean, all the stuff is, I mean, a lot of the stuff has been set on recordings anyway. So yeah, there's no, there are no secrets. Like, you know, and the, the beauty, the beautiful thing is there's room for everybody's interpretation too. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. Everyone's got something yeah. to say. Totally, totally. And it's like, um, yeah, the more, like, even if people take from what you do and like use it as a part of their own thing, it's like, 
the more the light shines on it's like when a light shines somewhere it still casts light on you mm -hmm. right so it's like the community benefits when everybody succeeds and if exactly. you're only worried about what you're doing it's like you're going to live a life in isolation yeah very true that was very wise danny um i just have one one last question for you why did you move back to uh to switzerland or no you're in Aust austria oh you're in austria yeah yeah so i um <clears throat> met my then girlfriend now wife in switzerland and uh so we dated for most most of the time i was in switzerland um we happened to meet like you know a few months into my my time there and um yeah totally hit it off and then we like kept dating while i was living in in rochester and <laughs> i mean this is crazy so i was te jeff campbell was on sabbatical so i was the interim professor of jazz bass for a semester at eastman mm -hmm. while i was also finishing my master's degree at eastman while i was also going to europe every four weeks <laughs> and teaching uh the equivalent of a full-time teaching gig outside of that wow. so like yeah it's like masochistic love of being busy mm -hmm. which um was a bit a bit crazy so i kept on commuting back and forth and i had a like a bunch of tours in europe at the time and i was like screw this like i'm just gonna you know i'm just gonna move to i'm just gonna move to europe like like the the writing was kind of on on the mm -hmm. wall um I loved Rochester. Like I was in Rochester for ten years. I loved it. I have, I have, and continue to have the like my best friends from there, and some of my best musical experiences are from that city. And it felt like a very natural time mm. to, to. I mean, West. I was in Western New York for a total of 27, 28 years. So it felt like a very natural time to kind of close the chapter on Rochester, live here, really maximize my musical connections that I made in focus year, um, really focus on my, my, my health. So like not driving everywhere, but yeah. walking and, mm -hmm. um, you know, continue writing books and, and develop other ideas. So yeah, it all, it all kind of, kind of worked out. I mean, even, and even with the pandemic, like still finding ways to be creative and, and take advantage of That's right. uh, what's going on here. Yeah. I, I saw on, on your Facebook page, I think, maybe it's the music one but you have a picture with charles turner yeah and oh, he, he and i yeah we went to high school together in, in berkeley oh. he's my bff i love charles yeah he's yeah, fun we, we, he's a great singer he is yeah we we toured together for about two years in, in gordon webster's band oh so, okay yeah oh, it was wild like we had fun times <laughs> all over the it's place. always fun with charles yeah he he knows how to make make a party happen like yeah like like that south, yeah in south korea singapore he's like he was he was leading leading the charge and yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's fun you gotta have people yeah. like that around you totally yeah totally it's oh that's so wild yeah what mm -hmm. a small world yeah oh, that's right because he, he grew up in la yeah yeah i'll probably see him he's he's back right now so I'll definitely he want is. To see okay him. yeah yeah, Charles. Charles is awesome. Yeah, please give him. Uh, well, maybe not a hug. I don't know. Yeah, I'll Whatever give him a little salutation. Give him a little elbow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, awesome, Danny. Is there anything coming up? I know. You, I mean, you just like launched a whole entire freaking book. But do you have anything in the works that we should be looking out for? Um. Well, I. So I do a lot of online teaching programs. So I'm, I'm in the. Uh, second iteration of a, a program called the first call bassist um and this is like really a, a ear training intensive program designed for bass players like the the idea is i want my basically like i want bass players to be able to listen to an unknown jazz standard once and know all of the changes mm -hmm. and be able to play on it and we've, we've yeah. talked a little bit about this this goal um which is something that, uh, you know, talking before about ear training as being like a supplement rather than like a lifestyle. You know, that's something that, um, you know, even after I graduated college, it's like, you know, I had to really figure out how to make that a possibility for myself because that's what people expected from me on gigs. And it's mm -hmm. like, if you can do that, 
you could probably hear a lot of what's going on on in the music. So anyways, that's, um, you know, I'm teaching a, a version of that program now. I'm, I'm looking to host a, you know, a multi-day um, ear training intensive program for bass players over the summer and then launch the next version of my program in August. So very will be cool. more, yeah, more of those things. Um, I love, like, in case you can't tell, like, I'm such a geek for <laughs> the, um, I mean, all things ear training and and that way of, of musical participation, but also like the, the research behind it and designing the curricular goals and like mm. really figuring out uh, how to work with, with different students. Like I love that connection part of it. So um, yeah, that's all kind of, there's always stuff in the works, but that's kind of the <laughs> next thing that's, that's spinning out. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I'll always put links to, to your music and, and your projects and your books below but that's cool and do you also you have a facebook group or is that for the classes uh i do have a facebook group it's just called first call bassist mm -hmm. um and we have great conversations there about your training different recordings and i i will start to do weekly live streams in there just with nice. different interactive interactive workshops um lots of singing you know lots and lots and lots of singing um <laughs> I actually need to talk to you too about like how not to burn out my voice from doing so much singing. Um, I would, I'll, I would I'll, love. I got you covered. I'll help you out with okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So like I'm like my goal is to create a community where bass players can come and just be willing to be vulnerable and like really explore lots of these ideas that are maybe not as oftenly talked about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and just like su support people. You know, like I love. I love creating this, this sense of community. So um, the more I get into teaching, the more I realize how vital it was to my success mm -hmm. and how much I want to be able to create that for, for other people. So, yeah. Well, we'll ha we are happy for it. And uh, you're, so, you're so good at it and so generous with it. And the bass community is better because of you, Danny. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. It was nice to see Skywalker for a second. Yeah, he sends his meows. Yeah, he sends his regrets. Um, <laughs> my my cat finally she went to sleep. Uh, but yeah, no, really thanks, Danny. It was it was great to chat with you and I, with everybody. I'm sure there'll be a, a part two at some point. But uh, congratulations on on everything so far, and I'm excited to see what you come up with next because I know it's going to be amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for having me and like creating such a, such a cool, like, you know, community for bass players throughout, not just the pandemic, but like, I mean, just, you know, beyond too, like this thing has such, such huge legs and I'm, I'm like such a fan of watching these interviews too. So thank you for, oh, for thanks. That well, well, bass players are just cool. So it kind of makes it easy to begin with. That's true. Yeah. They have, they have good stories. You know, lot, yeah. Lots of, yeah, lots of good, lots of good stories and experiences to share. Yeah. Well, cool. Thanks so much, Danny. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Yes. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Katie. Yep. Yeah.